So, uh, what we're going to do for the next several months is uh, we're going to study the Old Testament feasts. We're actually, we'll go into a book of the Bible starting next week, but what I thought we would do is there's seven major feasts. There's a bunch of minor ones too, but what I thought we would do is as these feasts come about throughout the year, then what we'll do is we'll pause where we are in our study of whichever book God leads us to, and we'll spend, we won't, we won't be exhaustive, but you know, we'll probably spend a week on each one uh, as we go through. Passover is actually coming up soon. Um, happens around the time of, of our Easter or our Resurrection Day. So I just thought that, um, uh, you know, we've, we've studied these before. I really like them um, because... You know, God instituted all these feasts, by the way. All of them are described in Leviticus chapter 23. One chapter has all the feasts outlined. Uh, there's some other, they're mentioned in some other areas, but all the details about them are, uh, are in Leviticus 23. And it's important, uh, I believe it's important, well, number one, it's in the canon of Scripture. So therefore, God wants us to know something about it. And we can't just ignore the Old Testament, because if you think about it, what is the New Testament? The New Testament is a commentary on the Old Testament. <clears throat> Because what the New Testament does is it reveals Christ as he comes all the way through the Old Testament. And so the feasts are very important. And, and I think a main thing to understand is, is um, God is a God of structure and order. Right? And that's important for us to understand. And we'll see that. We'll see great examples of it as we go through these. You know, God is he's a God of order. He's a God of structure in the idea that he realizes, and Susan and I were talking this morning because she was reading 1 Kings, and about, she says, I don't think there was a good king anywhere. And I said, well, I don't think there was either. And, but, you know, when we look at something like the book of Zephaniah, and we see ourselves in Zephaniah because we see what Zephaniah was telling, his message from God was, hey, get your eyes off these idols and get your eyes back on me. So therefore, we, we look at that and we say, you know what? That's a lesson for me. Where do I have my eyes on too many idols? And so always through the Old Testament there is. And the, when you look at these major feasts, the idea behind them, from a, this is just my opinion, kind of a generic perspective, is that God, the, the great hymn, Come Thou Fount, well, there's a perfect line in that. It says, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the one I love. Right? So I believe because God knows us, and that's how we are, and that's how they were, they mean the Jews, that he instituted these as a time to stop and focus on him. Because they're throughout the year, they go they go year long, and I mean we have they, these are just the major ones, and you haven't put in there Rosh Hashanah or um, Purim, which is based on the Book of Esther. But there are times because he knows we are prone to wander, and these feasts, some of them are a day long, some of them are a week long. But the idea is get your eyes off the world and off yourself and onto me. And I know you've, you've heard me say it here many times. I equate the feast, what God's trying to do is, when you have little kids, and they're getting kind of rambunctious or whatever they're doing, and you really want them to hear you because they're not hearing you. And what do you do? You get down like this, and you get right in their face. So they're like, you're locked on. And I believe that's God's view in these, is He wants us to lock on Him, get rid of these things that, I mean, we see reading First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, and why Zephaniah at the very end is coming in and saying, don't you see everybody else has been, in fact, when he's looking at Judah, he's saying, okay, Benjamin and Judah, two tribes. Don't you see what happened to your ten brothers? Your ten other tribes? They got destroyed. Why? Because they were unfaithful to me. That was a lesson that they should have been learning, and they didn't learn it. So, in each one of these Jewish holy days, God institutes things about His Word, His soul-inspiring doctrine, His truths, His plan for salvation, and His prophetic outline for history. Is all in these things. So, and these. So, what what should these feasts, as we go through and study, what what's the idea behind us? Um, I think there's a few. I think they witness to us. They witness to us. I think they warn us. Right? They warn us of what God can do, and what He's capable of doing. Uh, they inspire us, right? And they also comfort us. So. They warn us, they inspire, and they comfort. 
So, if you take these three concepts, and you say, okay, every time we go in to study one of these, we're going to look at where God's witnessing to us through this feast or festival, and where it's warning us, where it inspires us, and, and where it should provide comfort for us. That God is, which I think is, I think is what, what I think is what Jason was saying, is what, what Dave was saying is the comfort that you get out of this scene. God chastened Job, but yet he chastened him for his own good. Same thing we just read in Zephaniah. Right? God, what, why did God send the Jews to captivity in Babylon? He chastened them. And then remember the end of the, chapter 3 of Zephaniah, or the last part of chapter 3 of Zephaniah, was the great the great, their great idea that, look, we're going to come back. There's a time of chastening, but I'm going to bring you back. It's really, if you look at the Jews in captivity, then coming back, he's no different than Job. He chastened Job, right? And then he brought Job back. And the temple was rebuilt, uh, which is what they did. So, of these 20, uh, of Leviticus 23, we see all of these details. And um, it's interesting, they still celebrate them today, but yet because there is no, for the Jews, they can't do any blood sacrifices because there's no temple to do the sacrifice in. So they're really hollow. Uh, for the Jews today. Now, obviously we know that um, Christians, we're, we're under grace, we're not under the law, so there's no, we're not responsible to keep the celebration of the feast, but if we understand what they're all about, I believe it can greatly enhance our faith. And so we look at, even look at Jesus, who is all, all, always our prime example. What did Jesus do? He was a righteous Jew. He kept everyone. He went to all the feasts, and we read in Scripture where, because there are, uh, Three, I can't remember. Passover, what does not matter? Passover. There's, I think, there's three where they were supposed. They're called pilgrim feasts, where actually you're supposed to make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem to do it. The others you do back wherever you are. But Jesus did all of those, right? In fact, he celebrated all of those. And we see, remember, his brothers were mocking him about going up for the festival of, of um, tabernacles. Said, "Aren't you going to go up there?" I'm paraphrasing. Go do your tricks. And he says, y'all go on it. It's not my time to go yet. He was going, but it wasn't his time to go. But he was doing that. So, uh, what, uh, what does the New Testament say about these feasts? Look at Colossians 2, 16 and 17. It says, therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food or drink, or in the matter of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is Christ. So, we, we learn right there. And again, it's saying, he's saying, he's writing to the class, saying, listen, don't, don't get all tripped up in all this because they had Judaizers who were trying to say, you got to follow the Jewish law and everything's got to be great. He said, look, look we're, not, we're not under that anymore. So what he says is they are a shadow of what is to come. So, and the substance is Christ. So what does that tell us? That when we study each of these three things, in addition to all of these actions, we are going to look for Jesus. So we're going to see Jesus in all of these feasts and festivals. Right? In fact, start with Passover, the first one. Right? What's Passover, what, what does it signify? The blood sacrifice of the perfect unblemished lamb. There you go. Right, you see, I mean, it's easy to see Jesus in this one. Some of the others, you know, again, it's, it's an idea, I think, for us to kind of tear into. Uh, the church is free from legalism, um, and but the feasts are intended to be prophetic signs. Because if you think about it, if we can see Christ in each one of these, then what was God, why did God institute it all the way back in Leviticus 23? Because he wanted them to be looking for the coming Messiah. Because he's in there, he can, we can see him in that. Um, as I said, there's a it's it, the New Testament. If you think of it, is really a a commentary on the Old Testament because it fulfills the Old Testament as it comes through. So, what are the feasts? The word is Chang or Kang, um, and it's translated feast, even though the Day of Atonement. Um, is a fasting day, not a feast day. So again, it, sometimes it's always challenging when we're looking at words coming out of the Hebrew or the Greek because we're, we compare them to what we think, right? So our definition in Western United in the United States of a feast is food, right? Celebration. 
Uh, food is not the primary purpose, but they really, it's a time more of rejoicing. Maybe a better word would be a festival. In fact, actually, the word, the, the Hebrew word for feast, their festival, means a time of solemnity. Solemnity, so a time of quiet, which tells us what? Right? We're going to witness to us, it's going to warn us, because when we do these things here, we're reflecting. And a lot of these are based on harvests and planting times. And so one of the other things we get out of this is anytime we go to a feast, it's a time of reflection. Reflection on what? Well, we'll, we'll look and see if the reflection, Passover will be a reflection on our salvation. How God rescued us out of the slavery of sin and Satan's. Because that's the, the example of what happened to his people. Uh, the root word conveys the idea is, uh, of this, uh, uh, it's, almost like a, it's almost like a dance. It moves in a circle. I always think about it like marching around Jericho, right? The opposite, right? Because everybody say, hey, we're going to go in and we're going to attack and, and, and take over the promised land. Woo, let's get ready. Everybody's sharpening their swords and their spears and everything. And God says, hey, put those down. Get out your instruments. And, you know, everybody's thinking, what? So can you imagine the pushback Joshua's getting when, when Joshua says, hey, no, no, no. Yeah, put your shields down. Put your shields down. Get your harp out. Get your harp out. We're going to march around Jericho. And do what? See God deliver us. That's the difference. I need you to see it when it goes through that way. Um, feasts are appointments. This is another thing. They are, these things are set by God. Set by God. He actually instituted them. He said, I want you to do these things, and I want you to do this. And think about it. It always reminds me, when we go to the Lord's Supper, right? What is, what's the Scripture say? Do this in remembrance of me. <coughs> what did he say? What's God saying? Do these in remembrance of me. It's all a reflection back. So, you know what the very first feast is? The very first one is Sabbath. That's the Sabbath. is the very first one. So that's what we'll study and we'll look on that today. It's a, the word Shabbat or Sabbath comes from the word that means to desist, to cease, or to rest. To desist, stop something. There's a stopping there. And we're going to talk about the difference between the Jewish Sabbath, right, and, and the Christian Sabbath, two, two different things. The celebration of the Sabbath signifies that we serve the God of creation, right? Because when did God rest? After He created everything on the seventh day. Um, God appointed the, the, the Sabbath for a day of what? It's rest and worship. This is, and again, this is Old Testament. So we'll mark it down as Old Testament. Old Testament is rest plus worship. That's the definition in the Old Testament of what the Sabbath is all about. So, as we look at this, the, the, there are, so if you look at the ordinances of the church in the New Testament, what are the ordinances of the church in the New Testament? There's two. Got it? Anybody? Baptism. Baptism and communion. Yep, baptism, communion, or Lord's Supper. In the Jewish, there. Their two distinguishing marks were the Sabbath and circumcision. That set the Jews apart from all the others. Circumcision and the Sabbath. So there's were their, their two rituals. Uh, it is the Sabbath, again, Old Testament, is the seventh day of the week and, com and uh, commemorates God's ceasing of labor at the end of creation. That's in Exodus 20. So Exodus 28 through 11 talks about how that's it. He instituted it, and he did it as an example. That's why he says, "I go day one, I did this, and then I did this, and then I did this, and on the seventh day, I rested." So the example for the Jews would be on the seventh day of the week, which is their Sabbath. So again, we're staying under we're staying under the Old Testament, right? And it is the last day of the week. It's the last day. So again, we're going to see where God, through Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection, reinstituted those days. The Sabbath is a day of rest and communion with God. Look at Deuteronomy 5.15. This is a great verse. <clears throat> Passover. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. 
That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So do you see? What is it doing? Sabbath is always pointing us back. It's reflection. It's pointing us back to remember. Remember, I always like to say who you were and how you got where you are. How you got saved. So it's basics, always back to basics. And he says, why do you want us to remember this? Because he doesn't want them to do what? To forget that God's the one who rescued him. So then when we get to 2 Kings chapters 22 and 23, what did we figure out? They weren't celebrating the Sabbath. So guess what? They had forgotten all about God. They'd forgotten him so much. That's why he says here in Deuteronomy, he had told them, remember when you were, I want you to remember what I had. All that, all that means in 16 is that remember who saved you. Who did this for you? So when you go back and you look at 2 Kings 22 and 20, you see how, or the first chapter, first Kings, you see how bad things are. What have they done? What? They stopped keeping the Sabbath. So if you take Deuteronomy 5.15 and read it backwards, if you stop keeping my Sabbath, you're going to forget about what I've done for you. See that? See, God is, again, structure and order. If you don't keep the Sabbath, what God is saying is, you're just dumb enough to forget about me. And so what did we read in 2 Kings 22 and 23? Not only did they forget about it, they didn't even know what the law was anymore. They hadn't read the law. They hadn't had a Passover in hundreds of years because they got away from the first most basic thing, my premise, the most basic thing is they got away from the Sabbath. You can't draw a line from where they were to how bad they've gotten and not look at a verse like that and go, oh, well, they must have stopped. Because if they were celebrating the Sabbath, Every week, yes, sir. Oh, uh, back when I was fairly young, uh, all over Texas there was blue laws. You couldn't sure you couldn't even find a store open to sure. buy anything. Mm -hmm. And of course, no alcohol sold. And I mean, there was Publix was closed on Sundays till mm -hmm. probably 1985. Wow. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In fact, they used to have commercial TV commercials for Publix. Do you remember that? They had TV commercials. Showing a family at home together talking about how their people, Publix employees, were with their families on Sundays. So literally had TV commercials. Mm -hmm. <coughs> they do that today and they tell them they were racist or something. Yeah. Um, the Sabbath is a sign of the covenant between God and man. So the Sabbath is a covenant. So it's a day of rest and worship. It's the last day of the week and it is a sign of the covenant with God. So can you go back and look at the Sabbath? And again, we're, we're not under the law, so it's not the last day of the week for us. Um, but can you, can you look and you, can you see the importance for us? As crazy as the world is around us and as crazy as we are and as busy as we are, that we should take a day to rest and worship and think about the covenant that God made with us through His Son. That drives us back to basics. Drives us back to Deuteronomy 5.15. It says, remember who rescued you out of slavery of sin with a strong hand and pulled you out. You didn't do it. You didn't earn your way there. He reached down and snatched you out. That's what, you know, the sinners in the hands of an angry God, right? You're dangling over the fire, right, by a little thread. And God reached down and pulled us out. So, um, the Sabbath is a sign to remember our redemption. That's what I, Deuteronomy 5.15, that's remembering your redemption, where you came from. The Sabbath was a time, it's interesting, because as, I think as flawed humans, we tend to think of this works mentality. Of course, the Jews were eat up with the works, right? But it really, so if it's a day of rest, and there were clearly law, clearly in the law, it talked about things you absolutely could not do on the Sabbath couldn't do it. But when the emphasis becomes on what you can't do versus, let me tell you what it was. Instead of stopping working, it was to change our focus from the material to the spiritual. But we want to get caught, oh, can't work, can't work, can't do anything. Well, if you don't, if you don't do anything and you just sit, it's rest and worship. Right? Then the idea behind that is you're really kind of not doing it. Well, you know, I'm, I'm checking the box. Right? Because I'm not working. It's Sabbath. But I want you focused on me, not just saying, "Woo, 
verses, and now, okay, so now pull that to the New Testament, pull that to us. What is that? I don't need you just to pick your Bible up and open it and read a chapter because you're supposed to read a chapter today. I want you to pick up your Bible and open it up and seek me. That's the, otherwise, what do we do? We get, yeah, man, I get read my chapter today. Boom, check mark done, right? Now I lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to keep. If not far away, pray the Lord my soul to take. I mean, that what a, what a horrible prayer that is. And I prayed it all my life as a little kid, right? I pray that it'll take my soul. I mean, you think about it, you're planting seeds of doubt already. Um, so look at Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. If you, if you keep from desecrating the Sabbath, from doing whatever you want on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, seeking your own pleasures, or talking business, then, uh, then you will delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride over the heights of the land and let you enjoy the heritage of your father Jacob." For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I mean, go back and read that this week a couple of times. Really dive into it and think what he's saying. If you keep from desecrating the Sabbath. It's an if-then. It's a promise. He's saying, if you do this, I'll do that. Now watch what he says. If you keep from desecrating the Sabbath, in other words, from doing whatever you want, so now all of a sudden we say, don't be so self-focused, it's all about me. Right? And if you call the Sabbath a delight and a holy day and the Lord honorable, and if you honor it, not going your own way, seeking your own pleasure, then if you do that, it's a promise, then you will delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride over the heights. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a rejoicing. I will make you rejoice in, in, in the heights of the land and, and, and your heritage of your salvation. I mean, that's an Old Testament verse that just speaks right to us in the New Testament. Clearly. If, and so you can substitute in, and again, it doesn't have anything to do with the, a definition of, I didn't do anything on the Sabbath, I only did this. What he's saying is, find your delight in the Lord. You know what? I want to take the Sabbath and rest and worship my God. That's the difference. You'll find your delight in the Lord. So then it's not drudgery. Well, I've got to go to church again it's Sunday. I mean, if you got that attitude, stay home. Because you'll just bring in, you'll be Debbie Downer and everybody else around here. Do that. You know, sometimes, but sometimes you just got to get up and get going, too. Um, so, again, the idea is to change our focus from material to, to spiritual. And that's what, that's what Isaiah teaches us. The keeping of the Sabbath is considered equal in value to all the other commandments in the Bible. Exodus 31 says that. Literally. It said, and the only, only the only people that could work during the Sabbath were the temple workers. They could they could continue to do um, that. Uh, now go to Psalm ninety two. <clears throat> psalm ninety two is a Sabbath song. Psalm 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 psalm. Is it, it is. So let's and so this is in fact if you look at it in your Bible it may say a psalm for the Sabbath day mm -hmm. and it was a traditional psalm that was sung by the Jews on the Sabbath so again let's put our focus on what was God telling them how and how to approach the Sabbath which maybe we can see that could help us today in our approach so let's look what it says <clears throat> oh simple it's good to give thanks to the Lord and we can stop right there but it goes on to sing the praise of your name most high. Boy, well, that sounds like what we're fixing to go do across the street, doesn't it? To declare your faithful love in the morning and your faithfulness at night with a ten-string harp and the music of the lyre. For you have made me rejoice, Lord, by what you have done. I will shout for joy because of the works of your hands. How magnificent are your works, Lord. How profound your thoughts. A stupid person does not know. A fool does not understand this. Though the wicked sprout like grass and the evildoers flourish. Oh, Y'all see that in the world today? Mm -hmm. They will be eternally destroyed. But you, Lord, are exalted forever. For indeed, Lord, your enemies, indeed, your enemies will perish. All evildoers, 
evil. <laughs> evil doers will be scattered. You have lifted up my horn like that of the wild ox. I have been anointed with the finest oil. My eyes look at my enemies. When evildoers rise against me, my ears hear them. The righteous thrive like a palm tree and grow like a cedar tree in Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they thrive in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age, green and healthy, to declare, the Lord is just, He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in Him. Sabbath prayer. Sabbath prayer. I mean, that ought to be where we are on Sunday mornings. In that, remembering, looking backwards, looking forward, acknowledging. If you look at that, that's why when we start our, when we start our, our, our teachings in here, I always want to hear your praises. See, that's a praiseful people. They're remembering God's love and faithfulness. They're seeing God in all the things. So that when Jason says, well, I don't know if this is really, and it is a really big deal, to be able to sit there and look at the book of Job and go, wow, he chastened, but then he lifted and he elevated. You know? So I just think, I think those are great things that we should look at as we go through that. Psalm, the Sabbath is mentioned more than any other feast in the Bible. So it must be important. <coughs> Right? The keeping of the Sabbath was the only ritual observance instituted by the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. Think about them, guys. It's all about the things to do and not to do, but then it says keep the Sabbath. Every, every day, so every feast day is considered a Sabbath. So you approach, okay, so now we're going to learn how do we approach these feast days like the Sabbath? So go back and look at Deuteronomy 5.15 and look at Isaiah 58 and say, okay, and, and Psalm 92. All right, now that's how I'm supposed to approach the Sabbath. And that's how we're going to approach each of these feasts and festivals as we go through them and we look. Um, so now what we'll do is we'll contrast these Old Testament ideas of the Sabbath, right? So we'll contrast those with the New Testament ideas of the Sabbath and see where the difference is. So, um, the difference between uh, what we celebrate Sunday, which is the Lord's Day, versus the Old Testament Sabbath. It is the first day of the week in the resurrection, and it signifies the completed redemption. Go to Matthew 28. And I know this gets kind of boring as we come through, although Sarah likes it a lot. That I know. You can tell by the smile. You like the old stuff. Matthew 28. Listen, God gave us the whole canon of Scripture so that we can go seeking, seeking Jesus in it. So that's what we want to do, right? Matthew 28. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning. There we go. Right? Remember, Sabbath is Old Testament Sabbath. After the Sabbath. Right? Uh, as the new day was on Mary Magdalene, the other Mary went to view the tomb. There was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes as white as snow. The guards were so shaken by fear of him that they became like dead men. The angel told the woman, Don't be afraid because I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee, and you will see him there. Listen, I have told you. So departing quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, they ran to tell his disciples the news. That was through eight, actually. But do you see, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, resurrection day. So that's where, so ours is, we don't, Sunday's the first day of the week, not the last day of the week, from our perspective. So, the Sabbath is a covenant sign between God and Israel, which we saw. That, so, the Sabbath is a covenant between God with God plus Israel. Alright, that's Old Testament. Alright, now, New Testament. <clears throat> Where do we go with that? Sunday is the first day of the week and signifies the fellowship between the church and her Lord. It's the first day of the week and it signifies... So, where they have the covenant... This signifies the fellowship uh, with the church and her Lord. See the difference? Covenant between God and Israel, the fellowship between the church and her Lord. 
Because we are the bride. So the bride of the church is what? The bride of Christ. So see, it's a covenant, or it's a sign of that. A covenant sign between God and Israel. And Sunday is the first day of the work. And what does it do? It signifies the relationship between the church and her Lord. Observing the Sabbath was commanded by the law. Commanded by the law in Exodus 31. And punishment for not complying with the law, by the way, was death. So, but when we look at the celebration by Christians on Sundays, is what? It's voluntary, right? And it's a day of witness and work. So, this, this was, uh, where do we put that? Mandatory. Under the law, it was mandatory. For us, the New Testament is voluntary. See where we're going with this? We're just all we're doing is setting up the difference of structures, mandatory versus voluntary. Why? Because we're not under the law. Why are we no longer under the law? Because Christ fulfilled the law. Don't for, don't forget that Christ fulfilled the law. Therefore, we're under the grace. Now, the law is still there because the law. Every every one of us knows the law because God put the law on our hearts so that we would understand we were sinners. That's why the law is there. That's why we have the Old Testament. So if we have the Old Testament, we must study it and see it. So again, it's voluntary, which means there's no commandment, and it's also, it's a day of witness and work for the Lord. Because we're doing the Lord's work on this day. We're seeking Him um, in that. The Sabbath was an essential part of the covenant of works. Sunday or, or Sunday, or the Lord's Day, is a representative of the covenant of grace. Old Testament, mandatory, works. New Testament, voluntary, grace. See, because Christ set us free from the law. That's what He did. Because we couldn't keep it anyway. So we needed that. Uh, the Sabbath was the crowning day. When I say Sabbath, I mean Old Testament. The Sabbath was the crowning day of the week and rewards a man for his labor. So here, we'll just add one more. Uh, it's the last day of the week, and it's a reward for his labor. Right? Because remember, what, what, was, what did God do on the seventh day? He rested as a reward for his labor of creating everything. Now for us, though, the Lord's Day emphasizes what God has done for us through the work of Christ. So the emphasis here is, is, is the first day to remind us to start our week of salvation. So every, every Sabbath day, every New Testament every New Testament Lord's Day should remind us of our salvation. I mean, it ought to be the first thing that drives us. Why am I going to church today? I'm going so that I can humble myself, get rid of me, and remember, remember what he said in remember what he said there about in, in Isaiah. If if you can keep from desecrating the Sabbath, then you'll bring the delight. So if we want to delight in the Lord, the first thing we have to do is remember what He did for us. I mean, doesn't that, isn't that where delight comes from? Mm. Whoa. Because I remember what he's done for us, so we delight in that. It's interesting. So when we think about historically, so what happened to the, to the Jews, the, the Jewish converts there in Jerusalem? Because now they're torn, right? Because I got a law Sabbath, then I got, a, then I got a, a Lord's Day, which is voluntary. So a little bit of history on that. Um, they continued to worship in the temple. Go to Acts, I don't know if I wrote that up there. Yeah, I did. Acts 2.46. This is where the problem starts to come about. And we'll look, we'll look at some geeky history stuff here in a second. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and they broke bread from, the house, of, from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts. I'll add 47. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number. So they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. So what happened was, as they're trying, they're trying to, they're, they're, they understand. So a Jewish convert in Jerusalem in, at the time of Acts, 35 AD, 33 AD, wherever he was, understood they'd seen the Messiah. So they're looking Old Testament and going, that's him. So they're going, 
Passover, we've been celebrating Passover for all these years. Now, the significance of Passover is the idea that God rescued, Jesus rescued us from our sin. And, the, the, and so death passes over us from that, eternal death passes over us from that perspective. But what the Jews did, interestingly, was they got, they didn't like this. And so they actually passed a new liturgy, and I'll butcher the name, it's called Burkath. I'll write it down. Burkath something. And what it said was the blessing of the it's interesting. The blessing of the sectarians, which is and, and listen, this is this was a new prayer they instituted in the temple at the time when the new Christian converts were going. Here's what this here's what this new Jewish uh, liturgy said. As for the apostates, let there be no hope. Let the dominion of the arrogance, that would be Rome, may it be speedily uprooted in our days. Let the Nazarenes, which is what they call the Jewish converts. Nazarenes, because Jesus was from Nazareth, right? And the sectarians perish us in perish as in a moment. May they be blotted out from the book of life, and with the righteous ones, may they not be inscribed. <clears throat> Blessed art thou, Jehovah, the humblest to the earth. So he actually put a prayer in there asking for the Jews, asking for the Christian Jews to be wiped out. So, um, Give me a couple other uh, geeky history things. Ignatius, who was the bishop of Antioch in AD 110, historian, wrote this. He said, Those who walked in the ancient practices attain unto newness of hope, no longer observing Sabbaths, but fashioning their lives after the Lord's day, on which our life, our life, also arose through Him, that we may be found disciples of Christ, our only teacher. Isn't that cool? A.D. 10, he's talking about that. He's the bishop in Antioch that he's there doing that. Now, Justin Martyr, who was also another historian, wrote in A.D. 135, he wrote this, Sunday is a day which all hold common assembly, which we all hold common assembly. He's a Christian, by the way, so we all hold God. Because it is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and made the world, and Jesus Christ our Savior on the same day arose from the dead. And on the day called Sunday, all who live in the cities or in the country gather together in one place. And this is a cool line. And the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long as time permits. And it's interesting that they call the New Testament writings letters. He called them the memoirs of, memoirs of the apostles. Remember we studied in 1 John? What was he doing? He was going back and reminding them, go back to what you learned from the beginning, which was what? What did we tell you from the beginning? Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of the law. He, he died on the cross for us. So isn't that cool? So you see in AD 10, 110, and in AD 135, you're seeing they're, they're talking about the separation of the, the Lord's day versus the Sabbath because they recognized they were no longer underneath it. The Lord's day is dedicated to divine worship and witness uh, is a godly, wholesome, and altogether commendable. Um, and it should refresh the body and quicken the spirit. So, because, but remember, our salvation doesn't rest upon the observance of any practices or, under, or understanding these. We will understand these to enhance our faith and to enhance what we understand, what God, because even though we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, Back in the times when those were instituted, that they, they did not have the Holy Spirit, but yet we drift just as easy. And so the idea behind this is we understand that the that our salvation rests entirely, entirely, right, uh, on, on the finished work of Christ at Calvary. But what we want to do is we want to look at this as an example for us. We're not under any mandatory work that I gotta show up. But I tell you what, man, my week's not good. If I'm not here, I can tell you that. It's not. It's, it's, it's where I want to be on Sunday. I want to be with you. I want to be studying God's Word. I want to be worshiping with you all. And I want to use it as a time to come before the Lord and say, boy, this is a new week. Yeah, I, I can look back at last week and there's some things I'm not really proud of and some things I wish I could change. But you know what? God, you've given me a brand new week just like you gave me a brand new life. One day you gave me a brand new life. And each day you give me a new, a new challenge. And you give me a new opportunity to serve you. So, each of the seven major feasts are, 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 are a specific call by God to meet with His people at a certain time. Isn't it interesting? So when we look at that, when we look at these feasts, it's a specific call by God to meet with His people. That's what Sunday's about. It's a specific call by God to meet with His people. 
That's why we gather together to do this. So, uh, when we see the major feasts that go through there, so Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. This one, Pentecost <coughs> and Tabernacles, are called pilgrim feasts. And the idea is that if you can make it to Jerusalem for that, right? That's why, what, what did you have? What was the big deal about what we call Palm Sunday? What were the people doing? They were all gathering in Jerusalem for the Passover. And, and, and guess who was going to be the Passover land that year? Jesus. Right? That's why he rode in triumphantly in to, in, into that, because he was making his way in to do for the pilgrim feast. So each feast or convocation is a point in time um, and it predicts, can predict a, 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 a something in the future. Like we said, we look upon Passover, it's easy for us to understand the meaning of it, what it really meant and when it happened, and how it symbolizes our rescue from slavery of sin. Um, interesting is the first four feasts have already been fulfilled um, of the seven. So these four, when we study these, one, two, three, four, they've already been fulfilled. Passover's been fulfilled because of the idea of, of what Jesus has done. And then what we'll do is the next three, these last three, are going to look prophetically look forward to um, his second coming. So, um, interesting, the first four were fulfilled exactly the same day of the month as their original commemoration. Right? So, remember, think about, think about this. Structure and order. So, when did Jesus go to the cross? Passover. Had to be. So, when we go back and look, and you look at the Last Supper, that's not Passover Supper. That's Last Supper. Right? Passover's coming. Right? And Jesus had to do what? He had to go to the cross on Passover. That was it. That was the day that he had to go. So it's called a Passover Seder. That's preparation for Passover is what the Last Supper was. God is in control. He is precise. He is accurate. He has set specific events in motion. And he sees the beginning from the end and he wants us to understand it as well. Not, I don't mean understand like we know exactly when the the second coming in. But if we know that these four have been fulfilled and these three will be fulfilled, then we'd say, what? It should give us a different view of how to study it. So that when we go and we study the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, what are we doing? We're looking, it's been fulfilled. Well, who, who fulfilled the law? We read that in Colossians. Who fulfilled the law? Jesus fulfilled the law. So guess what? When we go to Unleavened Bread, Passover is easy. We all understand Passover. We go to unleavened bread, what are we going to do? We're going to look where Jesus fulfilled the reason for the feast of unleavened bread. Does that make sense? And I know it's kind of, well, I don't know if it's going to be, I think it's pretty cool. So, in order to do this and to look at this structure concept with God, what we want to do, and we don't have much time, but we'll, we'll, we'll go fast, is we want to look at the difference between the Jewish calendar and the Gregorian calendar. And I won't, I won't beat us up with a bunch, but it's, it's really important to understand because the Jewish calendar is based on the lunar cycle, not the solar cycle, right? The Gregorian calendar, which was by Pope Gregory in, I think, 1500 and something, it's set by the moon, I mean, set by the sun. But here's the reality. The lunar cycle is 29 and a half days, so the middle of the month falls on the 14th or 15th with a full moon. Okay, And it's important to understand that because as we go through these things, we're going to see they're called to happen at a specific time. Well, why is it important that a lunar cycle for the calendar versus a solar cycle? Because if you go outside at any time today, you can see the sun, right, wherever it is. And if you go outside tomorrow, assuming there's no clouds, the sun's going to look exactly the same every day, right? The difference with the lunar is the moon is different every day. So even somebody who was illiterate could tell what time of the month it was by looking at the moon. And so all these things were set up first of the month. That's why if you go through Scripture, Old Testament New, you're looking and going, and in fact it's cool, and we'll look at this in Ezra and Nehemiah where he actually initiated something on the exact time. So think about the lunar cycle. It's, it, has the, it has an impact on nature. The sun doesn't make the tides rise and fall. The moon does. Right? And you see animals. Animals move with the moon. You buy in here that hunts for fish. People look at so lunar table. They look at the lunar tables in order to decide when to go hunting or fishing, oftentimes. Um, the Jewish calendar, so they have 12 months, but what's, what, what's most important is that the... Um, uh, 
God used the lunar system. And think about this. Think about Genesis 1. In Genesis chapter 1, how did he describe it? God repeatedly stated there was evening and there was morning equaling a day. So God placed evening first. Which is actually cool because it's a spiritual picture of us. We started in spiritual darkness and we came out in spiritual light. Started in the evening, came the day. That's the way God describes it. So the Jewish calendar starts in the spring. The first month is the month of Nisan, N-I-S-A-N, and that's in March, April. And it never it doesn't follow, it never follow, follows our months exactly because of the lunar cycle, 29 and a half days for each month. So when we look at March, April, that's about when so last part of March, first part of April is Nisan. That's the first of the month. Um, first day of each month, uh, well, we won't go into all the all the, the geeks. Um, <clears throat> You can tell the first day of the month because you see the, the from a from a from a from a no moon to a to the slightest sliver of a crescent, and then they would actually then the, the priest the high priest would actually say that's the day first day of the month that's how they would know okay 14 days from now is this celebration starts or 15 days from now this celebration starts. Um, what's the importance of the first day? Watch this the first day of the month. So God gave themes for the first day of Nisan, which is the first day of the year. Uh, for new beginnings. Uh, the tabernacle of Moses was dedicated a year after living Egypt on the first of Nisan. King Hezekiah cleansed the temple. That's 2 Chronicles chapter 29. When did he do it? First of Nisan, right before the Passover, 14 days before the Passover. Cool. Watch this. Ezra started out his return trip to rebuild the temple the first of Nisan. That's Ezra chapter 7 verse 9. Details. Why are details important? Because God is a God of structure and order. All these things. He started that day. Go to Ezra 7, verse 9. Want to get even cooler? Watch this. Nehemiah. Artaxerxes gave the decree to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah 2 1. First in the sun. Yeah. It all comes together. It all comes together. It's not numerology, but it all comes together. We find this is also tied to Daniel's vision of 483 years until Christ died on the cross, prophesied exactly to the month and year. Woo! Right? It's all there. I mean, think about it. It's all there if we want to take the time to study it. See, so when we look at that, we start talking about Daniel, and you start looking at the days that this happened. Next significant day is a tenth of Nisan. And this was a day of sanctification. So, four days before the Passover, the tenth of Nisan, Moses told the people to prepare the land. And what happened in Jerusalem with all those years later? Palm Sunday is when Jesus arrived in. The Passover lamb being prepared four days before. See, it's all come together. Also, on the tenth of Nisan, Israel crossed the Jordan into the Promised Land. Isn't that cool? That's when he crossed the Jordan. In the, was on that day. Think of 40 years wandering the wilderness, getting everybody staged up to try to go. It was important that they went into there on the 10th of Nisan. That's how it structures. Christ, our Passover lamb, was cut off on Palm Sunday, which was the 10th of Nisan. Right? God presented Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and some didn't accept Him. The fulfillment, it was the fulfillment of Daniel 9.26. He was rejected. Daniel 9.26 talks about the Messiah being rejected by the religious leaders. So there it was. And this led to his trial and crucifixion. It had to be. He was cut off on the 10th of Nisan just as the Passover lamb was set aside after four days of inspection and sacrificed at the Passover, the last sacrifice of all. Right? Isn't that cool? It is to me. I don't know. Uh, just kind of seeing it all come together. So that's so we're going to start somewhere next week, but then we'll get Passover probably. I, Passover is April 22nd this year, I believe it is. So we'll get when we get to that Sunday, we'll do that, and then we'll we'll these are fall and these are uh, no these are spring and these are fall, and then we'll come back and hit those later. All right. I'll notice if anybody comes back for Passover, and we'll see. <laughs>